people, including myself, many times have not stopped and thought that, wait a minute, is what I'm getting, are the blessings favor? Well, here's what I have to tell you. The answer is no. What we call favor is actually the fruit of having favor. If I would hold an apple in my hand, what is more important, the apple that I hold in my hand or the tree that bears it? If I want to have more than that apple, do I just take care of the apple or do I take care of the tree that bears the apple? And the answer is obvious. If we take care of the tree, if we're in the right relay, if that tree's healthy, we'll have plenty of apples. How many know I'm talking about? So many times we're not looking at the tree, we're looking at the apple. We're looking at the job, the money, the blessings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How many understand? Shake your head if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, what I'm trying to say to you, that there is a creator that created all things. He also created favor, which produces a fruit called blessings. So we need to understand that favor is not about the fruit it bears. Favor is about the health and the relationship that we have with the creator that made it. Because he's able, he's not going, well, you know what, that's all the favor I got. I can't do any more for you. If I eat that apple and it's gone, I'm going, well, I want another apple. Well, I'm sorry, that apple won't produce. You just ate it, dude. And, and you're going, well, how can I get more apple? Well, here's the thing. You can't get an apple just by going to the apple. You've got to go to the source. And the source of the apple, the source of favor is Jesus Christ. Now, the thing that you have to realize is favor has something that, that most people don't realize and is this. Is it's mandatory that we understand that favor comes from pleasing God and being in relationship with God. But pleasing God in relationship with God is something that, well, favor has to be earned. Where favor has to be earned, grace cannot be earned. Two different words, two different things. Where favor, I have to earn it. To get the blessing, grace, I can't earn it. It's free. And people get mixed up with that. But the only way that you and I get the blessing and by the favor is because we are pleasing to God and we have lived a comprehensive life with God. The Bible says that, that basically what it takes to get favor, and favor is this like God's just his pouring out of his love on us in such a way that he... He blesses us with stuff, all kind of stuff. Here, in the future, the, the, the life to come, he just, pour, because there's this rich, rich blessing with God, he says, That's, I'll give you favor now, and you receive those blessings, the favor. Now watch this. I forfeited my favor to, be, to give any freedom at all when I sinned. Because favor is dependent on a comprehensive and continual life without sin. Favor is, is, is contingent upon a life that is pleasing to God. Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River and the sky broke open and a voice said, this is my beloved son on whom I am well pleased. That word well pleased is also synonymous with the same word favored. He says, I am well pleased with my son. He now has favor as a man. Why was God well pleased with Jesus? Because he lived a sinless life and he lived it continually and comprehensively from the day that he was born as a man and even till that point. Now here's why I don't deserve favor and why I forfeited it, why I can't earn it. I have not lived a sinless life and I have not comprehensively, even after I've been forgiven my sin, even after being saved, I've still sinned. Anybody here been in my situation? I mean, there's like four or five of you here that haven't. Because you're sitting there going, no, I got saved. I haven't sinned since. Really? Do you know what it's like to live without sin? Does anybody know what that's like? How many like to live without sin right now? Let me see your hands. I'm just curious if anybody wants to live without sin. Let me look at you. That means put your hands up if you want to live without sin. Please put your hands up. Okay. You want to have everybody here live without sin? All right. Living a sinless life? You, you want that? I'm going to help everybody here. 
You're all going to do it with me right now. What? Yeah, yeah, really. For three seconds, you're going to live a sinless life. That means you're not going to think sin, you're not going to talk sin, you're not going to do sin, you're not going to be motivated by sin. Everybody look at me and say this word, TikTok. 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 Congratulations, you just lived three seconds as a sinless life. You didn't do sin, you didn't talk sin, you didn't think sin, and you weren't motivated by sin. So don't tell me you can't do it. But here's the problem. We're broken, so, and we're living in a world that's full of sin, so it's very, 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 very what? Hard. Because the Bible says all have sinned. You, I, everybody. And though it may have been easy for three seconds to do it, how many know Jesus lived 33 years and he did that, did not say sin, did not act sin, did not motivate by sin, did not speak sinfully. He didn't do anything. For 33 years from the time he was born to the time he was crucified, he lived pleasing without sin comprehensively before God. Would you admit to me that that's something? I mean, some people can't go three hours, three minutes. And even the ones that joyfully declare, well, I can't remember, I haven't sinned in a month or two months or three months. You're boasting. What's that? That's pride. And what's that? Boo. It's like the Pac-Man. Boo. You know. I don't know. There's just something about us that, that we're just so fallible. And you say, yeah, but you know, Pastor, he was God. And so because he was God, it was different for him. Was it really? God didn't stack the deck against us and not against him, or the devil, rather. We're all tempted by sin, but, but the devil, you think de the devil was taking it easy on Jesus and he doesn't take it easy on us? I'm going to tell you what, if anything, the devil tempted him more and come after him more, more continually, more doggedly than he ever does us because he knew who he was. And if he, and he says he became a man and he, Jesus, was tempted in all these sins just like we were. He wasn't exempt. As a matter of fact, he got a heavier load than we do. So he had to face sin and temptation, depression, suicide, hopelessness, just like we do, abandonment, rejection, critical, hurt, bleeding, hungering, just like we do, not as God. He did not face them as God. That's what you need to understand. It wasn't like God he faced them. I can supernaturally, well, that wouldn't mean anything because if he could supernaturally have the power to do that, it leaves us out in the cold because we're not God. But as a man, as a man, as a man, as humanity, he faced sin and lived a sinless life. Would you let that get down deep inside of you? Because to me, I'm looking at him going, whoa, that seems so unbelievable. That seems so unreachable. Would you agree with me? I'm like, I mean, like, if I even come close, I'd have to stop some stuff right now. I'm thinking about, well, what, what do you mean? Well, man, I, I'd have to, like, turn off my radio and turn off the television and turn off the Internet and not hang around that person and not do that and not read this. And I'd have to stop all that stuff just, to, just on the surface. Yeah. I, I, I'd have to spend a lot more time in prayer and I'd have to spend a lot more time just talking to God and, and meditating on God like we learned this week. I'd have to spend a lot more time, you know, just understanding God more and being a good neighbor and loving everybody and, and serving people. I, yeah. So what's the problem? If you already know what it would take to eliminate the temptations of sin out of our life. Look, folks, if you've got a problem with alcohol and you're sitting around people drinking, you've got a problem. And it's more than alcohol. The problem is you're still accessible to it. You may not be drinking it, but you're still accessible to it. And drugs. If you're hanging around people that are cutting all the time, you know, you're still accessible to it. You're accessible to all the spirits that are controlling the people that are so destroyed. When you walk in their home, when you hang around them, you're accessible to those. And it's just going to be really hard not to be tempted when they're all around you. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
That's why we really do need to be full of God's Spirit because we can't go lock ourselves in a Christian bookstore in aisle three. We actually have to go to work with people that cuss and take God's name in vain and F this and do that. You know what I'm talking about? So what does it mean? Well, our minds have to be hidden Christ. Our hearts have to be saturated with power in the presence of God so that it may, we may be in the world, but the world may try to splash on us, but the world can't stick to us because we're like Teflon. Is Teflon still real? Does anybody know? Okay. When I was a kid, they used to say Teflon was a big thing. You know, It didn't stick to anything. And so what keeps us where we can actually have the blessings of I can't earn the favor because I'm not sinless. Well, here's the thing. I have forfeited my rights, but Jesus didn't forfeit his. When he became a man, when he died on the cross, when he took went on the cross, he took my sin, took my place. He said, I'll offer my sinless life and the favor I have for you that don't deserve any favor. You can't earn the favor. You haven't been sinless. You don't have the intimacy of from the day you were born. Your life hasn't continually, 24-7, every day of your life has not been pleasing to God. That's what favor is, remember? And I have to look and say, yeah, you're right. You got me there. So understanding that the only way that I receive favor which should be the first thing I'm looking for, not the fruit. If I can get you just to change this, because I'm, I'm spending a lot of time here because so many of us want, well, you got the blessing, you got the da-da-da. You know, sometimes if we look at the fruit, we're going to mistake ourselves and think that that fruit has something to do with whether or not we're accepted by God. Listen, some of you look at people who are getting blessed and say, well, who am I? I'm nobody. Well, I must be a failure. Well, look, God doesn't like me. God doesn't, have, God doesn't you know, care about me. God's just ignoring me. God's not hearing me. Why? Because I, that person gets that, and that person gets that, and that person gets that, and that person gets that. So you associate, you associate being right with God because they got stuff. And that stuff represents being in right relationship with God. That stuff represents the right path. Stuff doesn't represent path. How many would agree Jesus had favor with God as a man? Raise your hands. Tell me something he owned. Let me see whether well, there is his house. No. Okay, well, there was that new car. No. No, it was a donkey with a good news. No, with a saddle. Hmm. Well, it had the iPhone tint. No. You name me something that tells you that Jesus was acceptable and favored by God by what he had. But that's how we look at favor. Well, I must be right with God because I got all this stuff going. See, sometimes favor, and there's nothing wrong with the fruit. I don't want to discount that. But what we got to understand is that favor is not about the fruit. Favor is about the relationship with God who gives us the fruit. So some of you get yourself in a tailspin going, I must be nothing to God. I must be junk. I must because I didn't get the blessing that, the, that he got or that he got or she got or she got. No, 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 no. Jesus used a rock for a pillow and slept outside today because he knew it through eternity. He had a, he had a throne in a castle up there. Jesus endured the hunger and the pain and the nails and the death today because he knew what was going on up there for eternity. You and I too many times are willing to trade off to get just for today and not think about eternity. So please, if you don't get anything else today, understand, don't get the cart before the horse. Don't put the blessings before the one that creates the blessing. Give the blessing. If our life is meaningful and rich and Jesus is in the first place, you know what? 
you're really not going to be too concerned about the stuff, but you still will need stuff. But it just doesn't become the thing. How many say a good amen? Okay, so, like, who knows about that man, Edmund Hillary? Edmund Hillary. Anybody who knows that is? Anybody remember history? Any got, got any rock climbers here? Edmund Hillary was the first to summit Mount Everest. Okay. All right, how about this? Ferdinand Magellan. Any historians here? First to what? First to sail. Who said that? You did. Who else? Somebody else over here. First to sail around. His brothers. Two brothers knew this. Amen. That must have been the same teacher in class or something. Okay. The first to sail around the world. Okay. Neil Armstrong. First man to stand, step on the moon. I haven't been there. Okay. Roger Bannister. Just raise your hand if you know who this is. Roger Bannister. He's the first man to break a four-minute mile, running a four-minute mile. Those are all really cool firsts. It's like, okay, really good. Let's go on. Well, I, you need to think about some first here. Jesus is the first and the only to meet God's standard to become and earn his favor. Jesus is the first and the only that was able to earn the favor that his father had. And he was willing then to give it to us. We all agreed it, it's quite a task just to be able to earn God's favor. Being sinless 24-7 and right relationship with God. We all say, man, I forfeit. There's no way I can do it, man, because I, you know, I can't remember all the times I dropped the ball. I can't remember all the times I said. I can't remember, all, you know. And some of you may be in church today thinking you might already plan on what you're going to do this evening. And you know it's not right with God. Or tomorrow. Can I tell you something? God loves you so much. He loves me so much. He said, I've done everything I can to put favor, my favor upon you so that you can receive the blessing here, but more important, the blessing for eternity. Eternal life is eternal. And it has the blessings of eternity with it. Man, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to go to heaven. I don't want to go to heaven just to meet Peter at the front gate where he's got this big book. Set. I, you know, I'm not worried about that. I'm going to heaven. They may have to call security because I'm going to try to run past him. I don't want to stop and see my name's in there. I already know my name's in there. Come on. If you've got to stop to see if your name's in there, you're in trouble. You say, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, you can know your name's in there right now. Oh, I hope my name's in there. Get out of my way. I'm coming through. I'm running through those stinking gates, and if it's locked, I'm going to smash my way through it because I have this kind of body, I won't get hurt anyway. And I'm going to run right past Paul and Peter and all those other guys, I'm going to run right past Moses, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to find Jesus. And it won't be hard because you look for the brightest place in heaven. And it says the righteousness and truth are the foundations of his throne. So what holds up Jesus' throne is the fact that the platform of it is made of righteousness and truth. Have you ever thought about it? That's why God wants us to live righteously and truthfully. Because that's what holds up his platform that he's sitting on. And out of that comes a purity and a light. and a, It's wonderful. We're going to run straight up there. We're going to grab hold of Jesus. The one we've been praying to. The one we've been singing to. The one that's carried us through the storm. The one who would listen when no one else. The one that saved our soul when we were headed. We were headed the wrong way. We were headed for, the life, for death. We were headed into despair. We were going places with the man, the woman, the mother, the father, the husband, the wife, the brother, the son, the daughter. Your friends have abandoned you. But God's almighty son, Jesus, never did. That is the greatest fruit of favor, the eternal fruit of being together forever in his kingdom. So don't settle for something less. 
Don't settle for what we get here for what we want, really want up there. Don't live for blessing to blessing. You know, too many people are on time they're praising when they want something. I want him. Do you hear me? I want him. You mean you never need to? I didn't say that. I said, I want him. He's first. And I believe there are a lot of people, that, 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 that their hearts are raising up, and they're saying, I want him too. How many know what I'm talking about? How many want him? Raise your hand. You, I want him. The stuff's good, Pastor, but I want him. I'm going to quickly give you, talk about contentment, a fruit of God's favor. And then I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can, but I can't guarantee you anything. Amen? All right, here we go. The world says to worry. Now, the fruit of contentment is huge. If you worry, if you're a worry work, if, if, if you have discontent, if you're never satisfied, you know, the world is all about fueling that for you. Let me say it again. Worry, anxiety, discontent, the world is all about pouring gas on that on you every day. Okay? No matter how many good things we receive, or how many blessings I get, we live in a world that's always pushing me to be discontent, pushing you to be discontent. We can have the greatest blessing today, but maybe by nightfall we're, we're just not satisfied. We're always wanting more. The world says worry. The world says you be fearful. The world says to fret. The world says you think about the things you need and the things you don't have and the things you really want. And whether or not you're ever going to get them. The world says you stay focused on that. And what happens is I end up worrying if that's all I'm focused on. But Jesus talked about anxiety. He talked about fear and discontent. Go to Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Matthew 6 25. Here's what it says. And you may want to write it down because some of you need to take this in your Bible. Because before nightfall some of you are going to be tempted with this. Matthew 6 verse 25 and verse 33. I'm going to use these two specific verses. Verse 25 says this. Are you there? Don't worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Now drop down to the 33rd verse. Seek the kingdom of God first above everything else and live righteously and he will give you what? So getting everything that I need, notice the word need, not wants. Everything that I need comes first from seeking the kingdom of God. That's another way of saying seeking God first, putting him first. All these other things are given. How many see that? Raise your hand. It's not about getting the stuff first. It's about seeking God first. He wants us to know that following him is not just conforming to what a bunch of rules are. He's saying, seek all my rules and all this regulation and all this red tape and I'll give you everything. He's, is he saying, no, as a matter of fact, that's not what you're supposed to do. Here's what you're supposed to do. Work this along or serve this long or do this, serve in so many years of this, and then you'll get my favor. No. He says, seek his kingdom. Seek him first. Because it always goes back to him. Three times in Genesis, he talks about material blessing. And so, I mean, three times in six verses. Matthew 6, staying in the same verse. Matthew 6, 19. Turn with me, please. Matthew 6, 19 says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures up in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break and steal. Wherever your treasure, there's where the desire of your heart is. So we can spend all of our time gathering stuff here. Gathering everything here. But I shouldn't. Because the stuff that I'm gathering here won't last. 
Our metal cars will rust out. Our wooden this and that we make that we have, they will rot. The clothes that you have and you, I mean, have you ever gone to your closet and you, you had a nice sweater or you had some nice clothing or suit and you put it on, you know, you, it's been in storage for, until the winter comes and you look and there's a hole in it. And a moth just absolutely ate a hole in that expensive sweater or nice garment that you had. He said, that's what goes on in this world. We spend all that time, man, maybe, and maybe I saved money, maybe I budgeted money for that sweater, maybe I wanted a cashmere sweater, man, and those were expensive, you know, I just didn't want a wool one, I just didn't want a synthetic one, I wanted a cashmere, soft cashmere, and I spent my money, saved my money, bought it, wore it last year, and I'm looking so forward to getting it out this year, and I get it out, and there's a hole on it. That's like people that spend all their time focused on this world. See, what happens is a thief will come and steal what you have. A moth will come and steal what you have. A rust will come and destroy what you worked so hard for. He said, don't spend your time. Don't focus on that. That's a very simple rule that Jesus is telling us. And I think, I think that we need to understand that our, our heart is going to long for the things, the treasures that I set my heart on. If I set my heart on stuff, oh, if I can only get that 25-foot boat, or if I can only get that new shotgun, or, or if, you know, if I can only get, you know, that, that, that thing done in my house and remodel where it looks just perfect, or, or my lawn just manicured perfect, or, you know, or that another pair of shoes to add to the 30 I got. If that's my focus, if that's where my heart is, my heart is right there. I mean, think about it. How many here wanted something really bad and it took you a long time to save for it and you got it? Let me see. Really? Really? What, what was that you wanted? It was a what? A pistol. A real pistol? Like you don't have it with you right now, do you? Okay, all right. Because you're on the front row. All right. <laughs> What, what's something else somebody saved a long time? Back there, Debbie. What, what, what? Something you saved a long time for and you got? That many? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. But something you really got. Name one. Something big. I'll let you think. A car, see? Anybody here a teenager one time? Or did you kind of skip from kids to being an adult? Any, most kids want a car. Most kids, you know, have to save to get a car, unless you're so blessed to have a parent that just gives you a car. Come on. That's not wrong. We want to bless our kids. But, but, the, but, but the bottom line is, do you still got the car? How many ever saved up for an appliance? You still got that appliance? How many saved up for something to wear? You still got that? The bottom line is some of our stuff just has an expiration date on it. Not that it's not any good, but we grow out of it. We think different of it. It's not the newest thing. And, and so these things are expendable. He says, but, but we don't lay up our heart. We don't set all of our energies, all of our finances, all of our thinking on gathering of these things because the moth and the rust destroy them. Something great to think about. Amen. The second thing, 20, verse 22 and 23 says this. Your eyes are a lamp that provides light for the body, and when your eye is good, the whole body's filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body's filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, man, that darkness is so deep. This, this illustrates this, that, that you and I, when it comes to focusing, should focus on the right things. Just as the eyelets... Uh, Light lets, comes into the eye and it focuses and it sends us the right way. We need to stay focused on the right thing. We don't focus on the right something. So what are your eyes set towards today? What are you looking at? What, what, what have you been looking at that maybe wasn't anything to do with God, but it was about stuff? Now, once again, God's favor can bring you stuff, but the stuff will never satisfy and the stuff does not have eternal purpose. 
We must first go after God. So set our eyes towards God, set our eyes towards the things of God, and we will have that relationship that we need. If our eyes, stuff equals God, that means no stuff means no God. Stuff equals God, that means stuff equals I must be right with God. No stuff means I must not be right with God. It gets backwards and it goes crazy. Now go to verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. That word actually is mammon, and mammon is actually stuff. So he says you can't serve God and stuff because stuff includes more than money. I serve God, okay? I don't serve money. The real rich guys in the world, they understand that they make money work for them. They don't serve money. They make it work for them to get richer. They understand the dynamics of it all. If you have a gift or you have an ability, you have to allow that to work for you, to benefit you. You can't let that consume your life or it will destroy you. There's a difference between having the right attitude and making money versus having so much money it consumes you and destroys you. People that get consumed by money, and that is their whole goal. When the market goes down, when things go bad, they jump out of windows and kill themselves because it was all about the money. People that get gets consumed about position and stuff, when they don't have that position and stuff, they think to themselves, my money's not be worth anything, I'm not worth anything, nobody cares about me, I have no value. Listen, that's far from the truth. Even if you have no money, even if you don't have the position, even if your job closes down, you are still a child of God. God doesn't think anything less about you if you're working for minimum wage than if you're working for $100 an hour. God doesn't think anything less about you if you're renting a house or living in a tent versus living in a mansion. Because to God, it's not the stuff. Look, Jesus didn't have a house. Don't tell me he wasn't favored by God. Don't tell me God didn't love him just because he didn't have a house and a car and fancy clothes. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to help you as I help myself if I studied this, understand that the stuff that I have can't have me. My heart can't be after the stuff. It has to be after God because I can't be after stuff and God at the same time. And there's what the dilemma is. Some of us say we're after God, but all the actions, all the word, all the time, all the efforts, all the energy is going after stuff. Over here. Amen's good. Right here. They beat you. Over here, you won. What am I saying? The body of Christ has some deep lessons to learn that don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is Santa Claus. I'm all with Santa Claus, man. I like to laugh at him. I like, you know. But I know he's not Jesus. I'm all about him handing out candy canes and ho, ho, ho. But he can't save me. That's what that story we talk about finding Christmas. It's trying to put it on the real, what Christmas is all about. Not the stuff, but. Well, Christianity isn't about the stuff either. It's about Jesus. That's why, here's the cool part. I have his favor because Jesus gave me his favor because when, I became, because when I became a Christian, I became united in Christ. All that he's promised, all that he is, uh, and all the promises of the kingdom became mine, not because of me, but because of him. So don't think you have to be beautiful enough or look and know enough verses or be spiritual. You know, if you have Jesus, he looks at you as spiritual. It's just a matter of letting it come out. There's nothing more spiritual than being kind to somebody and loving somebody. Being spiritual isn't telling them 45 ways and 35 verses about it. Honey, it's about doing it. Give me one person that chose love versus 20 people that quote love and don't do it, and we've got something going on there. How many know what I'm talking about? Give me, give me somebody that's out there sharing the gospel and witnessing versus everybody that knows 15 verses about how to do it and don't do it. I'll take that person who knows one verse and actually does it any day. See, because... We don't earn our salvation. 
We can't earn our salvation. We're not good enough. We're not sinless. But by grace, we have received favor. The unmerited favor. I have favor that I didn't earn. It's unmerited. Who did that? Jesus. I want you to get out from underneath this cloud where you're focused on the wrong thing. You either hear or listening. And I want you to understand how wonderful it is to have the freedom not to be held down by stuff and not to be held down by, by people and, and just, just live a life. Say, God, I'm all yours. Shake my head. Come on, shake your head. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, when I know that, I understand that, that people can hold me back, but God doesn't want to hold me back. People can have their own views and things, and that's fine. Let them have their own views. But I want Jesus. I don't care about your views. Living a life in Christ is to be united in Christ and after his goals and after the things that he wants us to have. I want to be an eternity-minded person. How many here, Pete? How many here? I'm getting ready to close again. How many people here get worried sometimes. You say, I, how many of you say, if I had a badge I could put on, it would say, worry, wart. Let me see your hand. I'm not, I'm, it's an enduring term. Come on, how many, how many have, get anxiety, like you get stressed all the time, anxiety, panic attacks, maybe, maybe not that bad. How many are just discontent? You're always not satisfied, or you, that's a whole different, how many see your hands? You just, He's never content, okay? For everybody here that suffers from what's going to happen, what's not going to happen, what's already happened, and what hasn't happened, Jesus has the answer for you. I mean, he's got you covered 360. The real truth of the matter, ask everybody to raise their hand, anxiety and worry is not a problem for some of us. It's a problem for all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. At some time in our life and some time in our day, we may not suffer quite as much from the person next to us, but we will all do with worry, anxiety, and anxiousness. Matthew 6, 25 says this, don't worry about everyday life, what you drink, what you wear. Look at the birds. They don't worry, and God feeds them. And aren't you more valuable than the birds? One day I was reading this, and I was thinking, And you're thinking, well, who's feeding them? And then, the aunt, you know, I was making a joke with the guys on the trip, and I said, who made this? And I, you know, God. And, you know, we can ask a bunch of persons, flip over the page, the answer is God, you know. And I began to think about that. And maybe you can think about this. Here's how simple it is. We see all these birds, and I don't feed them. You don't feed them. Somebody next door don't feed them. I mean, there are some people, bird lovers, that feed them. don't get me wrong, but most people don't. And we think, God feeds them. I mean, I don't walk down my sidewalk and see just a plethora of dead birds everywhere. I see them flying around. And God loves them so much, they don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't water, but God takes care of them. you got to know you're worth more than any old bird. So don't worry. Now, I didn't tell you don't work. And I didn't tell you let somebody else... Take care of all your... I, there's a part of responsibility that we have, but the bottom line, one of those responsibilities to stuff is not worry. Because when you became united in Christ, becoming a son and daughter of God, God says, now you have my favor, and so that means you get my blessing. I don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where your blessing is coming from either, do you? Some of you, some of you are self-employed. You literally have to trust God for the new client, the new work every day. 
Some of you work for companies that go out of business. You literally have to believe God that, that he's going to keep enough business coming into your company that you're going to have a job. See, in some respects, we're, we're, we're not much different than the bird except for the fact that we don't realize as much as they do because we think we're getting it done. We'll all get up and I'll work and I'll do this and I'll make my money and all that. Well, yeah, you're right. You, you, you have a part to play, but the bottom line is, what if all of a sudden you don't have any air? What if all of a sudden the company closes and you don't have a job? I mean, I'm talking about. I mean, how many would like to go out and get a job today and what you sell is bag phones? How many remember the bag phones? <laughs> You're going to starve, dude. Nobody wants a bag phone. Right? Or a real ice box where you had to put ice in it. You're going to starve. I don't want no ice box. What's wrong with you? So what does that mean? Don't worry. Turn to your neighbor. Say, don't worry. Be happy. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy, dude. Oh, that's child's play. No, that's, that's the kingdom. God didn't create you to worry. He wants you to be joyful, which I know is different than happiness, but some people, you know. God wants us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He wants us not to be in a position to worry. You lose your job, does he want you to worry? What does he want you to do? Pray! Pray! Some days I don't want to be happy. Some days I just want to kill something. Yeah, I do. But the bottom line is, because I'm united with him, I'm not going, I lost my job. God doesn't like me. I must have lost favor. I've done something wrong. Now what did I do wrong? How can I correct it? How can I fix it? No. No. In this life, you'll have troubles, you'll have worries. It, means, it doesn't mean you sin just because you run into problems. You're thinking of the thing, your stuff to, defining you when it should be a relationship with God defined. You, when, I, when I go into a problem, certainly I'll pray and say, God, is there something I've done? If I, if I really have that check. If not, I'm going, I know where this problem's coming from. I know who's trying to steal from me. I know who's trying to rob me. I know who's trying to destroy me. I'm not always wondering about if I don't have this, what did I do wrong? That's when, when, when we go through these struggles, we take them to God and we bombard heaven and we believe him for answers and we believe him to push back the darkness. Listen, honey, when you're sitting in a church and there's only three adults there and, and, and you've got a ministry team larger than the church that's attending, you can look at the natural and say, Man, did we make a mistake. Or you can say, I'm on a mission. Standing up, making the deposit, giving the money, doing the prayer, practicing for the silent. You can say, all that for nothing. Or you can say, no, it's not about, this is about eternity what we're dealing with. You see, the souls that are coming are out there. They're not in here. The people that are going to fill this auditorium on Friday, they don't know it yet because we haven't touched them with the Word of God. We haven't given them invitation. We haven't prayed, we haven't prayed to open heaven's doors above and the, and the power of God to come in this place, to push back the darkness in the Native American Indian religion. We haven't done that. But I'm going to tell you something. Now that we're here, now that we're, we're bringing the presence of God with us and we're going to push back the stuff in this area, just like you push back the stuff in your home, just like you push back the stuff on your jobs. When you are there, you represent Jesus because you're united with Jesus and because you're united with Jesus you have the creator of everything that you need in your situation you're like the supply line what do we need all right let's pray is it that simple yeah well what if it doesn't answer oh really 
That's not my problem. What if he doesn't answer? What if he doesn't answer? It's not my problem if he doesn't answer. Hello? God didn't call me to answer the problem. God called me to pray and believe him. What if I lay hands on them and they don't get healed? That's not my problem. What do you mean? I can't heal them anyway. Everybody grab your hand. Look at it. Hold it up. Come on, hold it up. Hold it up. This is like a lesson. Now turn and look at it. There's nothing in there that can heal anybody. But when God sends the Holy Spirit, you can lay hands upon the sick and they recover. And all you're doing is releasing the favor that God has on your life. Because he loves you so much that he gives you your forfeited favor for the favor that Jesus earned for you so that you can see healing flow. God doesn't want us to be discontent. But our biggest problem of being discontent and worrying is we forget who the creator is. And we forget who the supplier is. We forget what to put first? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Shake your head. Is anybody getting this? Not really. Are, is anybody getting this? I believe today is so important to, to be taught because it's the answer to what about 90% of people that I know need because the other 10 already know this. It's the thing where you stop the tail from wagging the dog. And you let the dog wag the tail. It's the thing that lifts burden of worry off of us. And we can be like a bird. Bird doesn't get up in the morning and say, oh, let's start worrying. We don't know where we're going to get anything. You know, bird just, oh, I'm so thirsty. Where are we going to get it? Look, it's 90 degrees. It's not going to rain. Where are we going to get it? And all of a sudden, he sees somebody walks out in his front yard with a water hose. Water in the bird bath. Now, I don't believe the bird says, thank you, Jesus. But see, they don't even have the relationship we have, and God takes care of them. I don't know what your need is today. But put God first, seek God first, love God first, and let him just pour out his favor on you. You know, the amazing thing about most of the people going on a mission trip with us is that most of them do not have the money to go on a mission trip with us because it costs money to go. We got Many times there's plane tickets or rooms or food and things like that. But they feel so impressed that, that they want to, to do something for God. They feel so impressed that, that they want to win souls that they're just allowing the favor that they believe that they have with God to reach out and, and God supply the need. Well, why can't we do that with our utility bills, with our insurance payment, with our medical bill, and everything else? We can. We can. If you'll take what I'm saying this morning, it's going to turn you around and make you a pauper, for ch change you from a beggar and a pauper to a kid's, the king of a kid, the kid's king, serving a king. I'm, I'm one of God's kids, Right? Bow your heads all over this place. God doesn't want us to be worried. He wants us to be content and trust him, to pursue living for him. God has promised to take care of your needs. Oh, it may not look like or feel like what you want. It may not come exactly the way you think it will, but it will come. He will turn your want to plenty and your need to abundance my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. But the end plan here isn't just to get you through the week or the month or the year. The end plan is to get to eternity. To get to eternity. Sadly, I know a lot of men that have a lot of stuff, but they don't have Jesus. Jesus. So as far as I'm concerned, they have nothing. Just the stuff that rusts and rots, that's what they have. They have nothing. Today, 
You don't deserve, I don't deserve, nobody deserves, but God wants to give you his favor. He wants to be reunited through you. He wants to, he wants you to come to realize he wants to come into your heart. He wants you. Oh yeah, he'll use your position, your talents, and everything. Sure he will. But he wants you. That's why I can't just want what Jesus gives me. I gotta want him. Here today and say, Pastor Tony. I need, to, I need to turn this thing around. I've been looking more at his hands and what he, I need from him and what I want from him. And my life has been like, well, I don't have that, so I must be a second-class citizen. Or, or I don't have that, so I must be, God must be mad at me. Or I don't have this. So you've been looking at it wrong. You say, Pastor Tony, I, I've been looking at it wrong, and I like to pray. Let me see your hand. Lift your hand up high. I've been looking at it wrong. I've been looking at it wrong. I've been looking at it wrong. Be honest. Lift your hands up high. There's other people who say, well, I've been looking at it right, but I'm telling you, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. I, I don't have the newest iPhone. I don't have the newest car. I don't have a house that, that doesn't need repair. I've got, I don't have a, a, the job that takes care of everything. It's hard. But I'm just asking God to give me grace. I'm just asking God to give me an unmerited favor to get through this day. I'm just asking him to give me the peace through this day. I'm just asking him to, give, to show his love to me this day. Because I don't know that I'll ever have that, but I want his peace. I, I want him more than anything. Let me see you. Let me see you. Would you stand with me all over this place? The first thing I want to say to you is I want to pray for folks here today where you're standing to experience God's peace God's favor. But for those of you that realize you first need to have God in your life first, you first need Jesus. When we dismiss today and be standing right here to spend time with you, to pray with you, not rush you through like a bunch of cattle, but to spend time with you and a man woman, and pray with you about that. Because you want to set your priorities straight. Jesus, at the preaching of your word, let there be a confirmation of the Holy Spirit that this is right. This is right. You said from heaven when Jesus got baptized, this is my favored son. I am well pleased. This is my son who I'm well pleased with. And you pronounced the blessing of favor over his life. As we pronounce you Lord and Savior of our life, help us with the power to live in the favor that you would have us to live in. First, Lord, making you first above all things, not things above you. Help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, empowered to live this life. For you that are they're having struggles with worry and depression and discontent, in the name of Jesus, listen closely, I command that spirit of worry that is haunting you, that spirit of anger, discontent, be broken from influence from your life right now. And let the favor of God by seeking Jesus first, starting right now, blanket you and cover you in the mighty name of Jesus. If you pray with me and believe with me, I believe by faith we have received what we have asked for. I didn't ask for a serpent or a fish. I asked for God's favor. I didn't ask for a car or a house. I asked for God's favor. Decides in such a way that that's what he wants to do. That's not what I need. He'll do it. Amen. The Lord Himself go with you, bless you, cause you to know Him more intimately. Put people in your path that you can show the love of Christ to. God bless you today. God bless you this week.